Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the break and are ready for this next session, presented by Carlos Azira, Chief Data Scientist at Creative Artists Agency. Carlos will discuss the transformation of his company from disconnected centers of analytics excellence to a centralized data team. Thanks for being with us. Carlos, take it away. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carlos Ariza, uh, Head of Data Science for Creative Artists Agency, and today I'm going to talk about our journey towards enterprise AI. So one thing that we realized when I joined CAA uh, about three and a half years ago is that the, the landscape had massively changed in the last several years, and it was just going to get more and more crazy, I guess. That's the right word. You think about it, streaming has become king even more now after the pandemic. So Netflix is spending $19 billion in content in 2021. Disney Plus, by the time you, you hear this, will have more than 100 million subscribers. Spotify is averaging 28 million podcast listeners per month. So measuring things just using Nielsen ratings and box office is just not good enough. Right? Streaming has become the new currency. Now, also the value of content is evolving. So the way people value their own content and the way people are paid for the content is changing. Intellectual property is more valuable across different platforms. Things that emerge as a book or a novel become valuable movies or podcasts. And then they're still changing how uh, artists are getting paid. They're getting paid upfront, what's called buying the back end, right? Uh, instead of receiving a long stream of, of revenue as things go to syndication and they get sold internationally and, and all that. So that's a major change and the industry is still trying to adjust to it. And then last but not least, we see a, a real problem with the lack of clarity and performance metrics. So it's very difficult to know exactly how many people watch. The platforms are not actively sharing that information. There aren't um, standard measurements. So, uh, and we don't know if um, just eyeballs and views is more valuable than engagement. So that's, those are all open questions. So in response to this, we basically established a data analytics capability at CAA. And our mission is to accelerate the creation of opportunity for our clients through the use of data analytics. Now, early on, we had major questions, right? Did we build this inside or outside our IT department? Uh, how big should this um, organization be? How centralized? Because obviously we had centers of excellence across the, the organization. So. To answer those questions, we went to the source, and we were lucky to be starting kind of from scratch. There was very little in terms of an actual data analytics infrastructure. So uh, we went to uh, analytics at work. And this is, if you're familiar with Tom Davenport, I mean, he's been writing about analytics for more than 15 years. And um, analytics at work is, is one of his books that gives you kind of a nice template for how to build an organization. And he um, and the, his co-authors in this book uh, established this a model called the Delta model that allows you to basically analyze where you are in your analytics journey. And we realized that we were straddling between stage two and stage three. Definitely not an analytical competitor yet. Data was very siloed, lots of islands of technology and expertise, but no cohesive effort. And uh, I think the leadership understood that we needed to do this, but they weren't really sure about how to go about it. So that was then, uh, and this is now, right? So uh, what's happened uh, as of last summer, we actually had profiling force by Tom Davenport as a case example of how to use analytics for competition, which is very rewarding, right? Being able to see that the journey and following the template gets uh, gets recognized in the press. And, and we definitely feel the difference. You know, uh, data has become uh, critical, a, a part of, of the way things get done in the agency never to replace the agent, just to augment their intuition. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through the presentation. But that's that's really where we are right now. We feel like we're moving fast towards that analytical competitive phase, which is where obviously we want to go. So how we're organized, it's interesting, right? So we have we, we have decided to to specialize a little bit within our team. We're a total of about 20 people spread across four different buckets. The data science group, we concentrate on algorithms, data experimentation, data quality. The data analytics team concentrates on visualization and interactive dashboards. You'll see some examples of that later on. And really about data storytelling. It's a very different skill. And then we have a data insights team, which is basically a team of business analysts that are great at using the data and great at translating the, the, the data insights into actionable insights that can be used by our agents with uh, in negotiation to support our clients' uh, vision and dreams. And of course, at the bottom, we have data engineering really supporting 
uh, our computing storage and production pipelines, right? So they're in charge of making sure the data is uh, timely, up to date, organized, and, um, and 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 it's an ongoing process, you know, because vendors change, vendors come and go, uh, they upgrade APIs, they change the file formats, and and our needs change as well. So we we demand a lot of, of uh, data engineering, as you can imagine. So that's our basic organization. I would say uh, what we like to call our secret sauce is this concept of data unification, right? If you think about data in kind of in the old world, people would log into a UI and download a report and then log into another UI and download a report. And, and eventually that becomes difficult to uh, maintain. It becomes very difficult to join and, and traverse from one source to another. So we, we recognized early on that unification was the, the secret sauce that would allow us to, to kind of take a, a leap in, in automation, take a leap in productivity for our agents and so forth. So we're connecting four major areas. We're connecting data about audience demographics. And we say audience, sometimes it's social audiences, sometimes it's uh, viewership audiences or listening audiences. Uh, we also have obviously transactional data, internal data about our deals, our financial system and CRM. Uh, we have social affinities, which come out of surveys and panels that connect brands with audiences and interests. And then we have, of course, performance, um, meaning viewership, listens, um, engagement of different kinds. And they're all come, they all come from different vendors. We handle probably at this point more than 20, 25 vendors externally. And, uh, and then internally, of course, we have different sources. And th that number changes uh, all the time. So to give you an example, and again, this being a, an entertainment uh, conference, you probably are very familiar with this issue, right? But um, unifying titles is um, a, a pain across the whole industry. And many efforts have been tried, um, either e EIDR being one of the most famous ones in terms of trying to integrate across the industry. It's, it's good, uh, it's not fully accomplished as a vision because some vendors don't participate in either. Some of the information is not fully populated or it's not accurate. So it becomes an issue when I wanna know, okay, is this, in this particular example, the Real Housewives of Atlanta, right? There's so many pieces of content that belong to that intellectual property. Um, do we unify them all? Do we keep them as separate? Sometimes if you're trying to track social conversation online about the show, all of these blend together. So there will be one show ID for that uh, social conversation. But if you're looking at content and cast and all that, then you're going to have all these different entries, right? And then, of course, this is just at the title level. If you go down to the episode level or even the season level, additional complications. So it's a, it's a difficult issue, lots of tools. Um, and, but at the end of the day, you, you, it's a key part of, of the value, extracting the value from these tools. So how do we get there? Uh, we, call it, we call it broccoli. We, we eat a lot of broccoli. And uh, what that means is we do a lot of this unification. And a lot of it is automated. A good percentage of it gets automated with tools like Tamer. We rely on Mechanical Turk for certain things. We do a lot of fuzzy matching using string distance algorithms and all that. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, we, we sometimes just have to roll up our sleeves and do it manually. And sometimes we uh, assign thousands of, of um, unification uh, mismatches to, to different teams and just say, okay, we're going to spend all of Friday morning working on this. So it's, um, it's kind of the... The data cleanup and being 80% of data science is definitely true, right? I mean, and this I think this is part of data cleanup, making sure that these matches are correct. And it, it happens across the all the data sets. So it's, it's making sure the right Instagram handle is connected to the right show or the right uh, talent, or it's making sure that if we switch vendors, which we've done a couple times, are the, the new vendor IDs match the, our old vendor ID. And over time, you build this, this asset, which becomes incredibly valuable. And we call it the Rosetta Stone, right? So the Rosetta Stone allows us to traverse across different vendors. And it's we're not trying to replicate replicate initiatives like either. The either works at a much deeper level and they work across the industry and they fund it differently. So this is only concentrated on the vendors that we use and at the level of detail that we need. And uh, it's basically our version of uh, master data management uh, effectively. And that's that's what it is. And, and we it allows us to extract value and, and connect all these different sources. So what you're gonna see now is a few examples of how that unification adds value to, to our clients. What we did, and this is built in Power BI if you're curious, we use uh, a platform for business intelligence called CAA Intel. So across the agency, 
and outside our clients and so forth, they know this platform as Intel. And Intel is kind of our brand name for kind of the, the external shell that, that surrounds our, our data team. So at first, one of the first, first things we did is to understand social reach and social audiences. And this becomes particularly useful for things like commercial endorsements and so forth. So in this case, for Reese Witherspoon, we know how many followers she has across multiple platforms, where the followers are, where are the followers' demographics, affinities, and engagement, and so forth. And, and then that's useful. But then if you think about, for example, uh, digital demand for shows, um, then that, that's a completely different data set, right? So you have to look demand over time. And again, we use different vendors for, for to track demand, but we can, we're able to say, okay, for this particular show, the, the demand over time peaked at this particular point in time. And we use that for comparisons or we use that to support negotiations of uh, next seasons, for example. So if, if, if the next season, uh, if this season was very, had very high viewership and very high engagement, then um, the, the deal for the next season should be higher. And, and it allows us to, to be on a better footing and, solve some of that information asymmetry that gets created if we don't have that information. Because obviously the platforms know how well the shows are performing. So it's, it's important for our clients to know as well and for our agents to know as well so they can balance the or level the playing field. Another, another source, for example, is looking at uh, some of the, the information that the platforms themselves are releasing. So um, back in February of last year, Netflix started to, pu to publish their top 10. So uh, we've been uh, collecting this information, analyzing it, and then using it. And it's, it's very powerful to be able to say a particular client was on a show that was X number of days as number one on, on Netflix and uh, on a particular country or across the world and so forth. So being able to use this information is, is very powerful for, for negotiating deals in general. And again, we, we do this at the company level as well. So one of the things that we do is also understand our buyers. For example, Marvel Studios in this example, you can see how big they are, the performance of, of their show, of their uh, films, and the performance of, of the content. And this particular example is just uh, motion picture performance and nominations and award wins. And this, this gives our agents a, a confidence when they come into a meeting to have uh, all this information at their fingertips, basically. Last but not least, obviously, our, our music touring business is also supported by Intel. And what we do with them is basically understand uh, recency. What cities have you played, in this case, around Atlanta uh, over the last 12 months or the last 18 months? And uh, are you missing any of them? And then we use, we're use we using machine learning to try to help with tour planning and prioritize dates and tours. Obviously, with pandemic, they've, uh, they had to stop touring. So there's been a lot of patient waiting in that department until we can have concerts live again. But, uh, but the tool, so that's, that's actually giving us time to develop more tools and test them uh, kind of in, on cold. And, and hopefully by, by April or May of this year, we'll be able to start using these tools again. So uh, in terms of machine learning, right? So what, what I've shown so far are basically examples of descriptive analytics at the end of the day, right? We have data, we unified it, we put it together, and we're able to then pull insights from those uh, data sources very easily, very quickly. But when you think about how to use machine learning, I think one of the things that became clear to us is how important similarity was to our clients. So it happens very often, for example, if, if a client of ours is being, a brand is querying uh, the agency and saying, we need a new spokesperson for our brand, the person that they choose may not be available. So if they're looking for Reese Witherspoon and she's not available, we can actually use our similarity models to say, well, People like Reese Witherspoon under certain criteria, um, and they're similar because their audiences are similar. So it's not because they look similar or because they worked on the same thing. It's because their social media audiences have a lot of overlap in terms of what they like, in terms of the demographics, psychographics. So using that information and building what I would say uh, from an algorithm perspective is a relatively simple principal components model, but it allows you to find similarity very quickly and then allows our agents to provide alternatives. So that's, that's on the audience side. When you start looking at casting, for example, or trying to put together directors with, uh, with a cast or, or finding a writer for a particular show, it's very interesting to see what they worked on before. So we use, we use traits and, and we have uh, every single piece of content over the last, uh, I would say probably about 20 years, uh, we've tagged uh, with, with traits using one of our vendors. And these traits allow us to prioritize and say uh, how similar 
two artists are. So in this example, Paul Rudd and Reese Witherspoon actually have a fair amount of overlap. And you can see that they, they both over-index on Valentine's Day movies. They over-index on date night movies, or, or movies for shows, obviously. Uh, romantic comedies, comedy of manners, farce. Success is the best revenge, which is kind of an interesting theme, right? So, so when we're working with traits, we're looking much deeper than just genre and, um, and, and, and box office or something like that. We're actually trying to understand, are they, com are they believable in this kind of material? And, uh, so this has been very helpful to, to support, uh, and get ideas about, about casting. And one thing that I'm going to keep emphasizing is that the, the machine is not making any decisions. This is just augmenting the intuition of our agents, not necessarily replacing them. One example I wanted to share, which is kind of relevant to where we are in history, right? Um, early in 2020, it became clear that something big was happening uh, with, uh, with the coronavirus, right? The COVID-19 epidemic. And we had a lot of questions, particularly in our touring business, about when can we come back? And, uh, and that, that was kind of the question that animated a lot of our analysis for I would say between February and June of, of 2020. So we spent a fair amount of time learning from the epidemiology trends and what was happening. We're not epidemiologists, I'm not claiming to be any of them, basically replicated some of the analysis that they've done and used that to build uh, simulation models that allow us to basically say, how would the, this epidemic and how fast a vaccine happens, how fast a vaccine is rolled out uh, will help us recover. So in, in this particular example, we created a, a concept of perceived safety and being able to say how safe do people feel going back to concerts. And, and as you can see, the way we modeled it, and this, again, these are models that were built back in April of, um, yeah, around April of 2020. We had a, a fairly big dip during the lockdowns, and then there was a little bit of a comeback during the summer. And then at the end of 2020, we were back when we had the highest spikes. But now as the vaccine rolls out happens, there's basically, there were basically at the time multiple scenarios. You know, if the vaccine comes out in early 2021, we'll see a recovery. But if it comes out a year later, for example, that's what this light blue scenario does, then we may see a similar recovery, but we basically lose a whole year of revenue. So that those were interesting questions. Obviously, they impact things like budgeting, they impact things like uh, business planning, staffing, hiring. Uh, and of course, our, our clients' um, income. So, so very important to be able to to have this information as we were planning fiscal year 2022. And and it's an ongoing process, of, of course. But um, we consider simulation as part of our tool set, and we use it uh, strategically where we need to. So it's not a tool that we necessarily integrate with the rest of Intel yet, but we're planning to do more with this and things like in the future. So, what are the key lessons? Yeah, if you think about the lessons for that we've learned over the last few years, that there, there really are no shortcuts, right? We couldn't, we wouldn't be able to have to do what we do now if we hadn't spent so much time building foundations like data quality, like data cleanup, integration, and so forth. Uh, the second one is uh, using an agile approach and, and being smart about it in terms of saying, when we're building features for BI dashboard, we're going to use sprints and have a very disciplined approach of, to release and all that. But when we're doing experimentation in data science, we're going to use the Kanban approach because that allows us to basically keep things on the board as long as it takes without being a slave to, a, to an artificial sprint schedule. And a lot of it is focusing on reuse. So models that we build for one thing and code that we build for one thing gets reused on another. Uh, that's, uh, again, very modular, very, very agile. It's this work. Definitely involve the business. We do a lot of beta testing or alpha testing even with, with our agents. Uh, they get involved from the beginning. They, sometimes they help us identify new data sources themselves, and then we integrate it with the rest of the platform. The other thing that I, I mentioned multiple times is this concept of augmented intuition, and it's our internal joke is that that's our version of AI. We don't believe in a computer replacing humans. We believe in helping the agents think faster and better more productive, having new ideas. So, so the tool and, and, and the data becomes a way for agents to, to come up with better ideas for our clients. And lastly, we started being uh, basically what we were called a secret weapon for a while because the agents that knew about the work that we were doing were getting better deals. And over the last three years, we've become, I'd like to think, a strategic weapon for the agency so that we are used across, uh, across the board. So in terms of the future, we have a few open questions, obviously, things that we're working on right now. How do we value the work of our clients? What is a fair deal in a multi-platform environment where it's not just about box office or Nielsen ratings, but it's 
views and engagement on, on platforms? And then how should payment methods evolve to meet the, the ways people are consuming entertainment now? And, and I would argue kind of to leave you with this final idea is this concept of auditable predictive analytics. So if we and the buyers, the platforms, the the, 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 the Netflixes of the world could agree on a set of predictive analytics that helps you predict the value of the content uh, fairly and, and with shared data sources and all that, I think it would be easier to, to reach agreement on, on value and, and come up with ways to compensate uh, clients for better performance and so forth. So with that, I'll open it up for questions and thanks for listening. Great. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful presentation. We do have a couple of questions from the audience. And the first one is, what was the most difficult part about maturing the organization to stage four slash five? Sure. Well, in that case, I think it was really about trust, building trust uh, with the senior leadership, building trust with the agents, and having them basically allow us to take over some of the vendor relationships they had so that we could manage them and reduce overlap between vendors and all that. So, so that process of centralization that required to move up in the stages of maturity, um, it's all about building trust. And, but, and that, you know, it took time. It took time and it, it took some convincing, but I think we're in a much better place now than we were three and a half years ago when we started. Great. And the next question is, are CAA agents more comfortable using data now than when you started? Definitely. I think one of the things we've seen asking, it used to be more of a push process where we would come to them and say, hey, we found this uh, insight or we've seen analytics that can help you. And, and it would be more of a conversation about how could this be useful to me. But now we are actually have to implement the process to manage requests and prioritize requests. And, and uh, we have an online board where we track the requests and, and can prioritize by area and so forth because it, it's become more of a pool where agents are coming to us before a meeting saying, hey, I have a negotiation for the next season for a particular client. What data can you give me that's useful? So it's uh, really changed the, the way the agents work with us, and it's become more of a strategic tool for them. Right. And it looks like we have time for one more quick question. How do you recruit and retain data scientists for your team? That's a good one. It's, it's really hard to keep data scientists happy. They have to be constantly uh, intellectually stimulated, right? So we've been doing um, two things. One is that internally we're organized I would say as a, as a lab. So our a data science team is a, is a data lab. So they, they're scientists and the team are given a lot of flexibility to explore new algorithms, to explore new data sources, methodologies, and partner with uh, other consultants in the team. And also we've been partnering uh, with the universities, trying to do um, you know, presentations in classes, and that allows us to have a, a pipeline of interns that would eventually become full-time members of the team. So a couple of our data scientists went to our internship program and came from relationships we have at the university. So uh, that's definitely useful and very important. Great. Well, thanks for sharing all this wonderful information with us. This has been very enlightening. And to all of the group, we've got Survey with Yieldmo coming up next. And meet us over there. You can either access it through the virtual lobby or the pop-up that will jump here in just one second. We'll see you there. Thank you.